I'm so honored to be speaking to Lisa Gerard, the prolific Australian singer, composer, and other half of Dead Can Dance. So thank you, Lisa, for doing this interview with me. I, I'm I'm really grateful. I know you're I'm very happy. Yes, I I know you're back in in Melbourne. Um, I know you travel a lot, and I also yes. know that Melbourne is very cold right now. Uh, yes, it's quite cold, but it's pleasant. It's dry. Yeah. Do you do you like the cold weather? Yes. Because I I heard yes, it's, I it's, like the cold weather. I heard it's the coldest than it's ever been. <laughs> Uh, this year. Yes, well, it's not too bad. I mean, it's not like Siberia, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. but it's cold. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, 10 degrees. I mean, that's not that cold. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I, I don't think it's that bad, to be honest, but I like the cold because in the hot year in the summer, we're always concerned about fires. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. nice to oh, have a season where we don't have to think about everything burning. Yeah, I remember the mm-hmm. fire you guys had like a couple of years ago before the pandemic. It was awful. Um, yes, all the koalas were. It was. Um, it was terrible. Problem. Yeah, so uh, I hope we don't have that this year. Oh yeah. So, what do you too. think of the album? Oh, I, it's lovely. Yeah, very lovely. I've been playing it. Did on you my see sh- one? Of, did you see the interview? The um, the video? Yep, I did. You you released two so uh, two singles so far, right? Well, two videos, yeah. There's two videos that have been done, yes. Yes. And there's a third one coming. Yeah, you know, I've been a big fan of uh, Dead Can Dance for a very long time. I know prior to Dead Can Dance forming in, in Melbourne in, ni- in 1981, where you, were, where you were born and where you met Brendan Perry, you started your, your passion for music at a, at a very young age, playing the accordion. Yes, I've been doing music since I was 12. I met Brendan when I was 17. Oh yeah, and then uh, and so, I, know you, I know your instrument is the uh, you know the the yongqin the du Yes, the Chinese dulcimer. Do Do you still have that? Um, I know you. Somebody gave that gave you the uh, the first one. Yeah, uh, very long time ago. Do, do you still have that uh, particular dulcimer? I still have it, but I can't use it anymore because the tuning pegs have gone. Mm-hmm. It did a lot of work, this instrument. But I still play Yang Chin. I played Yang Chin on stage. Yes. We said it can dance only a few months ago. Yes. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, it's, it's totally mm-hmm. beautiful. Your, your voice um, is so powerful. I mean, I, I can't do an interview without talking about your voice. It is it is, uh, it's clearly an instrument that when you sing, you create mm-hmm. your own language. And uh, yes. that's 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 not of this world. <laughs> it's almost it's so sublime. It's so like God Godsend. You know, it's you've been described. See, um, I I don't I don't feel that. Not to disagree, but I feel that it's to, that my voice, my singing, and my singing voice is a voice that we all have. Mm-hmm. It's just the voice that we weren't taught to speak in, and mm. you know we don't. It doesn't have a system. It's not. It doesn't exist within the systems of pre-organized language, that's all. But I think we all sing in this voice before we learn to speak, from, you know, a practical language. Yeah, you know, um, you've, you've been described by many. I mean, um, just people that I know, people that you, you read it around, you, you hear it. You're one of the greatest singers of all time, uh, one of the most beautiful voices, wow. a true force of that's nature. That's amazing. <laughs> Haunting, divine. I mean, you heard it all, right? Uh, I just think people have been really sweet. I mean, I mean, I love singers. I love singing too. I love hearing singers. I love hearing singing. And I love to hear singing when I don't understand the language because it doesn't tell me how to think about what I feel. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think that's the most important motivation in my work is that I don't want to tell people how to feel. I want them to feel the way they feel automatically without being influenced by practical thoughts, you know. You know, when you, so, were, when you were a child, did you ever speak or created your own language? I've always sung in the languages that I sing in. The languages that I sing in, uh, they're, in they're innate within the music itself. Because I know that when I listen to music that I wrote when I was 19 years old, um, and I was, you know, even younger, 15, I mean, I don't get to hear that music because it wasn't recorded, but some of the things that I did when I was 18 or 19 have been recorded. 
And when I listen to them, I know the words. I know the words automatically. If I don't have to learn them, they're already there. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing. It's quite deep. So um, Yes, indeed. <laughs> and each piece of music has a different language. Some words are the same or similar, but ultimately the music itself depicts the, the, the coloration of um, the vernacular. So, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. That there's there's a word called um, there's a word called idioglossia, which is a yes, which is a language yes, invented. I've heard of this. Yeah, and, and it's it's a you know, it's invented by a, uh, spoken by one person. Connect, it's connected to twins. Uh, you know, which I find it really interesting. I know. I don't believe that my work is this. I don't. I don't think this is it because my words, uh, um. They're not meant to be understood in a practical sense. Idioglossia is something that two people can create a language together that those words become a different language to the language that they were taught to speak in, but they're based on memory. Mm-hmm. Where my words are not based on memory, they're based on the integrity of what's inside the work itself. So they're never exactly the same, but there is a definite um, frequency and shape uh, mm-hmm. that comes from different musics. And... You know, and I, it's not there to be analyzed or understood. It's there to open up the pathways of the heart so that if mm-hmm. you feel, if you hear something and you feel something, that belongs to you. It doesn't belong to me anymore. So the life is, the work has taken a life of its own and, um, mm-hmm. and it's opened up a pathway where people, I know a lot of people cry when, when they yes. listen to the singing, you know, but the thing is, I don't believe that they're crying because they're sad. I think they're no, crying no. because yeah. they're actually, they are actually having their own feelings. They're not, not having my feelings or the thoughts of someone else saying, you know, I love this tree, it's green, it's beautiful. They're not thinking about this. They're, because they have nothing to think about, only to feel that it becomes quite cathartic and they can sometimes weep a little bit because they're not used to being allowed to feel mm-hmm. without having a reason to feel. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And they, they obviously resonate with you. They resonate with... Um, with. I think they resonate. The thing is that it's a resonance and that's a really good use of word is that that frequency that we use when we sing mm-hmm. resonates it resonates, it's resonant, and it resonates within the other human being because there's something about sound. Um, I remember once I, I saw a, a Taiwanese opera. It was just, it was a, a group of people that came to an art gallery, and it was very, very loud, and they had a lot of bells and um, sort of like sword scraping kind of sounds and these voices that just, and I completely broke down. It just, it entered mm-hmm. into me and I was absolutely un- weeping uncontrollably. I couldn't stop crying and I couldn't explain why, you know, because it didn't make me feel sad or anything. It just, it overwhelmed my, my spirit in such a way that I couldn't stop. I, I couldn't process this without tears. Mm-hmm. It was really... Because, and I think that that's the reason why I've always kept going with my singing is because I really do believe that it provokes a sensitivity in another human being. It makes them sensitive. It lets them be sensitive in, you know, without making them be sensitive. It lets them be sensitive. And I think that this sensitivity, as we grow older into our adult years, we grow this sort of almost like a foreskin over the heart or over our sensitivity and we become hardened and once we become hardened we stop growing you know Mm -hmm. and we stop Mm -hmm. i mean we stop feeling and we stop using our other senses like our intuitive properties and you know we just use you know our materiality to um you know discern things and to understand things or connect with things when after a while the materiality okay you can connect with food you can connect with you know, sex or whatever, you know, there is a distinct materiality in these connections, but there is something about the abstract that keeps us sensitive. And I firmly believe helps us to make intelligent decisions. So I know that sounds like an oxymoron. It's like a controversy, it's like a controversy of, of, um, of reasons. But ultimately, I believe that that circle is, you know, we don't build, grow from intelligentsia, but 
ultimately this kind of work keeps people in a situation where they can make intelligence decisions based on um, softness and humility and, you know, a lack of vanity and greed and all these horrible attributes that we possess as human beings if we don't work on ourselves. So, you know, it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's this. And this is the vehicle. For me, this is the vehicle. There are other many, there are many vehicles. I mean, some people do yoga, um, and I believe it has a very similar uh, ability to just help us to just sweep away all of the the intelligentsia and mm-hmm. the um, the religiosities and the, all of those things so that, that we can connect with our center, our center, which I believe is our love center, because these things are born of love. Yes. And I don't know if you believe in God, but I, I believe that, I, I well, I know from what I've been told that if you know love, you know God, because God is love. So yes. anywhere where God love is, God is present. Yes. You know, so I, that to me is the work. That's where the work is. It's unlocking. It's opening up the pathways of the heart so that we can live in that light and share that light. And sometimes it's, it's confrontational because for years and years and years we've been told that we can't express ourselves. We can't go outside of the box. We have to stay within the systems of what we've been taught to do. It's unacceptable to step outside of that emotionally, mm-hmm. you know, and there's lots of trappings. And, you know, I notice a lot now with the guys that are coming to terms with, you know, the 93 genders and the 93 descriptions of the self. I think there's so many more. There's so many more than 93. It's almost an infinite amount of complexities that are attached to each human being. That You know, it's wonderful that, that people are able to um, describe themselves into different or sort of calculate sort of certain groups or whatever so that they can have an easier time of um, being able to move around their friendship circles without feeling like they don't belong and things. Anything like that that allows people to be more sensitive and be aware of another person's position or their feelings has got to be a good thing for the human race. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's got to be a good thing for the human race because otherwise the human race is, you know, we're not, we're not evolving. We're suffocating. And there's so many people that are suffocating, you know, I mean, I can go on for hours about this stuff, but (laughs) the easiest way to really solve this is, when you sing or when you create music and you dedicate all of your senses to creating something that unlocks your sensitivity, then I think that is a quick way. With that. It's, it's, not, it's unconvoluted, if there's such a word. It's not convoluted. Yeah. You know, um, I know back in the, in the early days when you, uh, when you relocated to, to London and you, you started your music there, you know, you moved it there. One of your first audience mm-hmm. was, uh, was a more darker crowd. I know in one of your interviews, you mentioned that the wonderful thing about Gothic people at that time was that mm-hmm. they were deeply sensitive mm-hmm. and intelligent. So when they came to the That's concert, right. yeah, they were able to communicate. Yeah. You, they were easy, they were, it was easy for them to yeah. communicate with them. I thought that was amazing, yeah, because when, I think because it was sort of a post, punk thing when the punk mm-hmm. thing was sort of a very fizzy kind of very elated uh, demonstrative and angry kind of um, time for people to say well we we want some change we want to sh- shake this thing up a bit and then beyond that there came this gothic wave or a new age new um, new what was it oh, I can't remember new uh, what was it called now uh, um, death uh, new romantic oh, the new, new romantic uh-huh. Uh-huh new romantic and then the gothic age and then when the gothics came i think they were a little bit shocked and disappointed when at first when they came to see Depp and dance because you know the old albatross dead in the name they thought oh this must be a gothic band it was just an obvious <laughs> that's what i figured and when they got there and they heard all these african rhythms and medieval music they must have thought oh no it was this, this is gothic you know so but it was lovely in a way because they were because they were deeply sensitive people. They were able to cross pollinate into that area and mm-hmm. realize, you know what, what, gothic is actually the, there is another meaning of it. It's just anything that is outside of those things that you know. It's a new age. It's a new beginning. Mm-hmm. It's a new era. So yeah. you know, it was interesting. It was interesting times. Yeah, and, and, that, and I found gothic people very gentle and very poetic. 
Yeah, and so I, and, I was and shocked because I... I'll be honest, I was scared when I first saw all these gothics coming in. I thought, oh no, this looks really <laughs> terrifying. But they were so sweet, they were so lovely. <laughs> yeah, and, and they're one of the biggest. They still love Dead Can Dance, and they love Lisa Gerard. They love your 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 solo projects, mm. and and you know, I, I think a lot of gothic people, you know, and I, I was certainly one of those that were. If I was lo- living in London, I would have been there. And I, I, I wow, think um, I, I think a lot of gothic people are born with a lot of plutonian energy, um, so they they're attracted mm. they're attracted to the deep, you know, the, to the mysterious and to the unique. And Definitely, that's what, that's what Dead Can Dance was. You know, you really were deep, and they couldn't understand it. It was mysterious to them. Um, and it's really strange when I look back at those times because Brendan and I didn't have we didn't nothing navigated what we were doing with the work. There was no, we just did what we wanted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we really didn't have any kind of, we were so um, single-minded and arrogant about what we were doing in a way because we just thought, well, what we're doing is what we understand and we just went for it and it didn't really fit in anywhere. And mm-hmm. in some ways, I still don't think it does. I mean, it really just doesn't. I mean, we've been called so many things, new Baroque, new this, or this and that. Or we've had so many labels put on us, but none of them have stuck. Because there's this really, for me, Dead Can Dance has been really, uh, it's been this extraordinary journey, not only um, from the point of the soul journey, which is through the work of music and singing, but also through the journey geographically of all these different continents and understanding rhythms mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. medieval music and, and you know, mm-hmm. Arabic music and, you know, Persian, you know, all these kind of things that have been something that we've learned from and embraced as musicians and composers. So, you know, it's um, it's been an interesting journey, but I really don't think there is, a name for dead can dance. I don't think there's a real. You, uh, yeah, you mean hard like, to, like genre? You yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. It's a tricky yeah. one to put into a genre. I know a lot of people. Know? A lot of people would, would ask me, and I go, "Um, is is original?" It's kind of. <laughs> I know. Well, imagine my position. I mean, people say to me, "What sort of music do you make?" And I'm like, "Oh no, you know, I, just, <laughs> I <Yeah>. hate it <laughs> when people ask that question because I don't know how to answer it." Yeah. I have absolutely no idea. All I know is that it's music and it's born of a really innocent, um, childlike desire to do something that isn't necessarily original, but something that can enter into the heart of the other and create some kind of positive energy, you know? Yeah, and, and your followers are all from different walks of life. I mean, it's not just... Totally. This, yeah, it's not just this crowd or this crowd. It's like... It's like everybody. No, and and you. No, no, you're absolutely right. No, it is. It's, we've got. I mean, we have a lot of children. The parents bring their kids, and you know, it's just interesting. I know. I look down into the audience sometimes, and it's so diverse. Yeah, you you have the belly dancers. You have the the other types yeah. of dancers. You know, you have all these different groups of people. It is amazing. No, you're absolutely right. I agree. It's um, been a great fun journey. Yeah, but anyway, I'm, getting on to Axaudia. Yes. We do, we've only got five minutes left, and then I've got okay, another call. Okay, so okay, we okay, should right. talk about yeah. the, al- the album. Yeah, the album is, um, this is an album that you're, you're collaborating with the c- composer Marcelo Di Francisi. Correct. Um, and you'll be releasing the full album coming out on August 26th on Atlantic Curve. Yes. And the, the, the name itself, Axaudia, Ex- tell us about that. I know it's... Um, it's defined as when the monarch grants a citizen of his kingdom an audience. Yeah. That is a very, yeah, it is. And it's also an, um, a geographic way of looking at it. I think, I don't think of the name as being, in fact, you know, you must know from my own work, I try not to, I mean, Marcello came up with the title and Marcello came up with the titles of the pieces of music. Mm-hmm. When I'm doing pieces of music, I try not to describe or explain what the music means because that kind of deflects from the fact that I want people to find their own message Mm -hmm. in the work, if you know what I mean. But yes, it is in the broad sense. I mean, well, it is. It's an auditorium of music for a civilization of people, which is us, you know, Mm -hmm. basically. That's what this album is. I think the one thing that does can be described is that there is a very feminine 
property inside the album. And I'm not saying femininity from a female femininity, a femininity from both male and female, that we all have feminine properties. Mm -hmm. And there's something very gentle and very subtle about this album. And it also has a physicality to it. There's a sort of, in the music that Marcello does, there's something very physical about this, which I find really interesting because what I do with my work is never physical. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I find that, that kind of connection between those two worlds really interesting. The, the, the metaphysical and the physical, you know, um, and it creates a wonderful uh, surface for, for sensibility. Yeah. Um, what can I tell you? So I think the videos, I think the videos, you're going to find the videos really interesting because they really depict, um, from the point of the civilization, they, may, they help you to see where you are. Mm -hmm. They help you to see where you are on this planet. That... Yeah. You know, which is really interesting. You, they're, they're very visual. I mean, I prefer an experience that is not visual. But when I look at these videos, I think they're remarkable. And yeah, Marcelo the made these amazing. videos himself. No, the, the, they're the, the, really Those beautiful. costumes are beautiful. They're amazing. And, the, yeah. you know, I mean, there's a few more coming out. They get stronger and stronger as they're growing along. But he's done the most extraordinary work. And he's worked extremely hard. Yeah. On making these, you know, and he's got such a wonderful ability to unlock a vis visibility and also with color, the introduction of very simple colors that just completely, they're almost like um, they break the blood vessel of uh, mediocrity, you know. They're mm -hmm. so beautiful. I'm really, I think they're really interesting and I, I hope people get... Well, there's been a lot of interest. Like we've had a lot of people see the first video. I think there's something like 50,000 oh, yeah, or something. I, I know that song, Until We Meet Again, is, is about longing. Um, yeah. And it, it kind of gives me that saudade feeling of long distance between two yeah. people. And yeah. And I, I, this album, was this, was this created during the, I guess, around the pandemic times, right? So it's kind of like yes, it was. Well, not that we're not out of those times yet. We're still experiencing some yeah. of it, but not as badly. But the thing is, you know, people are still dying of that thing. Yeah. But the thing is that, um, yeah, it was. And we had to figure out a way of working together during that time, which was sending files back together. But we're having a conversation today that we're really looking forward to being able to work together again when we don't have to send files backwards and forwards. Yeah. Because it's... There's not, you know, just the distance and the time. Look, it does, it's nice and it has its advantages in some ways that you get to spend more time on things. It's not as instant, but um, being in the room with someone, it's, it's, you can't it's, replace that. Oh, yeah, yeah. You really, because you feel an energy between each it's other an energy, and it's iron yeah. on iron, you know. Yeah, you know, it's very important. Energy is very important. And, and I know you feel that too, you know, being an artist and being so. Yeah. Passionate. Well, it is just energy, isn't it? I mean, being an artist is really, we work with energy. You know, I'm, I mean, I think, you know, the last two albums I've done are completely positive because we were going through very dark times. And when we're going through very positive times, we tend to do very dark music, you know, yeah. very deep and dark. So it's like the artist is always doing that, trying to balance, trying to sort of weave the loom so that there's some balance. It isn't all just one, you know, one thing that we have multiple sources of expression and experience you know so yeah, anyway true. darling i'm gonna have to go i've got the other call coming i'm so sorry okay, it's been so lovely uh, to talk to you okay I'm, i hope you have some information that you can work with because we spoke about jigs and dance a lot which was naughty really we should have been <laughs> speaking about this album <laughs> no okay okay but, but anyway thank you so much for a big shout out to uh, shauna from shameless promotion pr Thank you. Yeah. But if you get a chance, reach out to Marcello. Just contact the guys and ask if you can have his contact details because he's got some very beautiful things to share about. Yeah, I would love album. to interview him as well. All right, darling. Okay, you take care. You I'm take care have now. To Thank you so now. much. All Thank right. you for the opportunity. Bye, Thank darling. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.